Well, there I was on the beach, yes, blanking, catching nothing again. What's new there then? I'm doing my beach came in bit in between no bites, walking along, and I see some seashells. Oh, I'm looking at them, that's nice. This one's this one, this one, that one, that, 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 that. I thought, I wonder because seafood, shellfish, are very often cooked in shells. So from the beach, I sent Mike a text and I asked him and he said, yes, we've actually cooked those cone limpets off of the rocks, cooked them in the shell when he's been out doing a bushcraft type overnight one uh, down on the seashore and you get the embers of the fire and you put the whole shell into the fire and they bubble and fizz and they cook them. So I thought, wow, embers of a fire, it's really hot. I wonder, could I make a lead weight out of a shell? You know I'm gonna try, you know. And this is what happened. So what I'm doing, I just had the oven on low and in there, yeah, it's just warm. I'm drying, wow, it smells pretty funky, I have to say. Drying all the shells out there and there should be absolutely no moisture in there at all. So the next phase is, after that, look quite pretty like that, don't they? Next phase is, um, give them another hour in there and uh, get some lead and get it melted down and see what happens. That's what we try, it's going to be a cockle. Here, i just got my little wire loop made from a bit of coat hanger wire. There we go. And it appears. I can trim that up, but that one might have taken. Because the right way to really do this would be uh, bone dry sand. Definitely. I'm not worried about the overspill. I'll tidy that up later, just let that solidify a bit and then my pliers come away. And that should just get me... Yeah, that's moving still there. Gets me enough to tie my uh, fishing line to or thread through on a running ledger. So I don't exactly know. Let's have a look at this one. Oh, it actually does. My goodness me, you could use these as moulds then. Look at that. I haven't tidied this up yet, obviously. But it would make a shell mould. So, I thought, to be honest, it might actually stick to the shell. But it doesn't. Let's try another one. Oyster shell this time. You can see that's just solidifying there. Just watching it go off in there. Just that centerpiece. Bit of fun, people. Just trying something. I've no idea whether these over here are going to come out of the shell, so I don't think the limpet one will. But I might break a shell open and see what shape they make inside. And I thought what they were going to do is stay in the shell, but I don't think they are. I think if you had the right depth shell, you could actually use these as moulds by the look of it. Just an experiment, all just an experiment. I can see it does depend what angle you put your shell at.
Now I've got a load of shells. People, I have to say, these make really good moulds. Watch. Look. They all, the scoop ones, don't bond to the shell. I figured they'd bond to the shell. So you only need one or two shells and you've got all the moulds you need. Now look, there's the shell. Just tip straight out. Oyster lids. Where are we? Thing of the future. I can't stop making them now, they're so fast. So I'm running out of lead people on making them so fast. I think the way to do it is that wire the coat hanger is best. That's what I'm thinking. And I've got different size shells as well. But basically, you only need one shell. There we go. So I'm going to squeeze one more out the last bit of lead. So look, these are the ones that turned out okay, and they are absolutely oyster shaped. So they were going to bump along the seabed. Quite, I don't know what that's going to go, four ounces I would say at least. I've got a small one there, really small one. See with the swivel in the top, just there. See the swivel. So you only need a few. Another flat oyster one there, you actually got the oyster shape underneath. I figure that's a nice, about two ounces is what you want. That's a good two ounces with the swivel in there. That's probably four ounces. You see by the shape, I think it'll bounce along the seabed. It will look like another flatfish. And look, here you go. Look, watch. There's the oyster. There's the shape of the oyster. There's the ring. That's as good as it's gonna get. And I can make any, any number of uh, shells out of that particular weight one that I want. This one, you recognize it. It's a cockle. And it's actually got the same shape as a cockle. But with the weight bulged in the bottom, it's going to bounce along the seabed like this. I hope it doesn't snag. All good news, people. And I'm just going to see if I can break this one open, just purely because I want to see. Hasn't got, it hasn't got the ring, didn't take in it. So let's have a look, see what the inside's like. Oh, there you go. Oh, well there you go people, look at that. Inside is, so, now that's quite a nice shape. I know that one didn't take with a swivel. Well, it's got a tiny ring there. I could actually tie that on, a very small ring there. It's limpet shaped. Bear in mind, this is lovely and shiny at the moment, but it will go dull. Got the little ring there, little swivel ring there. I quite like the one with the shell, to be honest. That's totally different. That one didn't take properly because I used too big a swivel, but you can see the principle of it. I can still catch fish with that, I can assure you. Very interesting experiment. Well, do you know what? Because they're flat, I think they're going to be really good for flatfish when I ever get out to try them. And that's one thing that really annoys me. Is anybody out there sick and tired of COVID and lockdowns? I mean, I just want to go fishing. It's not the greatest time of year, I know it's not, but I just want to go fishing. And the other thing, when I'm having a rant, I can't go to the pub with Mike and have a nice beer. And I, you know, we don't drink lager, we drink real beer, draft beer. It's just not the same as some of these pubs have had to pour. I saw on the press the other day, they pour in 4,000 gallons down the drain that goes off. And it's not the same. Look, I've got a bottle of beer, but I like the draft beer. I like to be in the in the pub, sitting in front of a nice log fire. There's a big picture of Winston Churchill up there. So we sit under that by the crackling log fire. It's just tradition. And we chew the fat over fishing, bushcraft, whatever. It's not there anymore. It's just not there. I hope it all comes back. But until then, aha. All is not lost, folks, because Mike had been in contact with a brewery, Driftwood Spars Brewery. He's kept me some and he put a box outside my uh, gate 
And I said, Dad, I've left you a beer out there. Try this one. It's called Alfie's Revenge. Six and a half percent. Now, let's see if I can tell you a little bit about the brewery. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They printed it so small, it's a two glasses job. Driftwood Spars Brewery was originally established in 2000. It is situated in the stunning Trevornance Cove. St Agnes, come on, my love. Don't know. The brewery is part of the Driftwood Spars Pub and B&B &B and probably has the best sea views any brewery has. That means at some stage when this COVID's over, oh, 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 I've got to go down and do, and do an interview down there. Hopefully, anyway. Next time you're down the beach, pop in and say hello. This is a 500ml bottle. It's crafted in the cove. A strong, tasty red. Mike said they're all different. Oh, crikey, I can't see a thing with two pairs of glasses on. Mike said they're uh, different tastes they've got there. So I'm going to try this one. But he got me this one, which is like the hobgoblin type red. He said, that might be the one for you guys. But is there anybody out there? who's missing their draft beer from a pub. There must be dozens and dozens of guys that watch our show. Let's check this one out. You connoisseurs. Listen to that noise. Something of a lively head coming. It must be a young one. There we go. This one's a sort of a strong, tasty red. Cheers, Mike. Thanks for dropping that one off for me. That's different. Mm. I want to know why it's called Alfie's Revenge. <laughs> Am I going to pay a price for this later on? Anyway, guys, just going to let that head settle there. I might have sucked a little too quickly. We got a log burner. Strange things happen with log burners. You put different types of wood on there. The wife said, come and see what's happened to the fire. So I go in to see what the fire's doing. It's green. <laughs> I said, that's a sign of money. Now, my grandparents always told me it was either blue or green in the flame. It was, oh, that's a sign of money. That's good luck. Should do the lottery or something on back of racehorse that it was back in the day. Fortunately for me, I wouldn't bet on the sun coming up tomorrow. I'm not stupid. Anyway, does anybody know out there what random piece of wood I might have put on the fire there that burns this colour green? because I have never seen anything so vivid before, it can't be good for you. It looks like it's a piece of driftwood from Fukushima. Who knows where it's come from, guys? Put in the comments page what you think is in there. It's going to be some nasty chemical somewhere in that wood, I don't know. Or is it something natural in there? I don't know. And who can remember whether it was a blue flame or a green flame that was lucky if you saw it in your fire? Having said that, I do think that was in the old coal fires from years ago. It must have been gases that were trapped inside the coal. Right, they had a little digression. We're not finished yet. Although I can't get out fishing, what I did do before the lockdown was go out and help Mike on some bushcraft jobs. And with it, a cook-up of skate that we caught down with Tomo. Here it is, guys. Sit back and enjoy. It's just something to watch. Well, he's got me on a, on, a, on a mission to go and get birch bark. Hopefully, I've got a knife to get the birch bark with. Oh yeah, I've got my bushcraft knife, boys. Fist grip, descaler, thingy for whatever, and pretty sharp. Now, let's get off on a hunt and get some birch bark for him. So I've got some there guys, but I can see it's probably off starting to rot out of the inside. I guess it'll dry out. I wonder if I should get a piece. 
off a vertical one that's not been lying on the ground. I'll keep that as a spare and then go get some more. Well, he said go off and get some twigs and stuff like that, but they're all wet. So I went into our pallet cabin over there and I found some of our firewood there. But instead of using all those little twiggy bits, I think I'm going to make one of those things, I think he calls it a feather stick, where they, where they shave it like this somehow and uh, just make lots of little curls on the end. So I'm going to give it a go and see if he can't light it with that. Well, <laughs> it's a sort of a feather stick, people. It's a sort of, it's, it's a similar one, isn't it? It's similar, it looks like, I don't even know what it looks like, to be honest. Those things on the eggs of, end of legs of lamb, when you have a leg of lamb, they put those on the end for a little napkin thing. But hopefully, if he gets a birch bark lit, he can light this, and then we're away. Now, when I was uh, about eight, nine years old, I used to get the job of splitting down wood for my grandparents. You know, it's one of them, I don't think they had any heating other than just the one stove in a kitchen. And they used to give me a big knife, a youngster, and you used to be able to put it on the top like this, just bang it once and then rock it like this and run it down. Now your fingers around the blade, I wouldn't want to be doing it with Mike's bushcraft knife, but this one's got plenty of blade to get hold of. And then you can split it down much easier and you'll find the fire generally like this. You'll get a lot of small bits here. And if you didn't want to do it this way, you can get a piece of wood. And well, I can actually show you if I can find a piece of wood. Like this. Look. Just go straight down. Safe way to do it. So hopefully I'll get enough wood split down. And we'll see if Mike can light a fire with the uh, birch bark. Split all that down, lovely. quite good I can actually see that uh, I've come up with a new marketing ploy pallet wood chopsticks <laughs> it's got to be worth a go so I'm here with Mike special invitation to dinner isn't it Mike yeah. it is yeah yeah we haven't done yeah. a catch and cook in a while yeah we haven't done a catch and cook for some time so we're up at base camp camp one will be camp zero, it's that cold, it's going to be zero nearly tonight. So uh, I've collected what bark I think I've, I've done the right thing or not. Um, I've made some of those feather sticks, which is the best I can make. And Mike's going to tell us, run us through it for you. So I'm just making some scrapings on this dry piece of bark. This one here is a bit wet, you can see the green sort of mould almost on it. I can just tell by the colour it's definitely too wet. This stuff is, is good. There's a bit of mud on the back which isn't ideal. What you want is this pink, if I expose it like that. See that? There you go, you see that lovely light pink colour? There. That's that's what you want really, not the mud. That's the stuff that burns. Yeah, that's the sort of resinous part of the bark. So what I'm doing is I'm just scraping away. This is an old piece of bark and tell because it's really not very supple. I'm just scraping away the top layer and I'm getting to this kind of red, orange, whatever sort of maroon colour underneath. And that's the resin, that's the actual resin in the bark itself. Silver birch has amazing properties for sort of survival. So it's not the bark, it's not the bark itself that's going to burn, it's, it's like the, the layer cut. underneath, it's almost yeah. the little layer underneath. The bark will burn but it's actually this, this white layer, it's deceiving, isn't really the flammable part, it's this red resinous under layer that's just underneath it and you just need to expose it. Now one of the interesting things with silver birch is that the bark is the last part of the tree to rot. It rots from the inside out. So you've, you can see a dead tree that's you know years old and it's still got fire lighting uses because 
the, all the all the fire lighting potential is in the resin in the bark itself, not inside the tree. So I'm just making what's called a dust pile, really. Do you want me to clear that fire out while I'm out here, or do you leave that in there? No, we just need it level, really. I leave all that. That's all an insulating. That it's wet, obviously, but just level. As long as it's level, like that. That's, that's all we need, and then you, we are going to need, and it will suck up moisture, but we need a base layer. We need to, otherwise, it's going to be our fire that sucks the moisture. So these are, we're sacrificing these pieces of wood. I'll try to split them all. Yeah, just to suck up, just to stop the cold drawing the heat from the fire out. A bit like when you're laying down and sleeping on, in the woods, you need you need layers underneath. So I reckon that's enough. It's only a tiny bit of dust pile. Are you going to use what sparking tool for that? Just a ferrocerium rod or ferro rod. This is. Um, like a, it's called light my fire still. It's a real simple like beginner's way of doing it. They've got a, a striker that comes with it with a little thumb grip, so you can practice. Oh, instead of using your knife. Instead, of, I use my knife still personally. I get more control, but this is just handy for beginners looking to light a fire. And these are really soft steels, these ones, so you can get lots of sparks. And it's very white. So we've got some dry bark up here, and then really where I want to be light. As soon as I light this, it needs to almost be in position. It needs to be ready, so I need to be a bit closer to the fire. It just gives me a bit more time if I'm closer to the fire, but once, it's not so much the, it's these that are gonna be the one that we need to light well. So I've got three things. I've got the dust, a bit of birch bark there, and then a little bit of a feather stick that you did earlier, Dad. It's part of that. So we've got three different things. That will be, this will not last long, this flame. So the, I need to quickly get that, those, these thin pieces of bark lit. These will burn for much longer. Once I've got one of these lit, that's all it needs. Then we can transfer the flame and make it bigger and bigger and build the fire up. And I've got to be careful because this bark is really springy and I could lose all oh the power. Way. Yeah, so that was just a practice go. So I, rather than slam my knife down like that and put all the dust and fur everywhere, if I show you over here, I'm going to pull the fire steel away. Yep, and that way, it. you know, it doesn't matter. It might take a few goes. There you go. You've gone up. But the heat's still there. There you go. Let's get this lit. Just one. Right, that's now I can relax a bit because this will burn for a little bit longer than you think. Get the next one ready. Now I can transfer to there. And then it's all about building up. Don't have to rush this part because the bark burns for quite a while. There's our feather sticks. These will burn out fairly quick. And now, oops, that's what you don't want to do. What, crush it? Yeah, crush it all. You need a bit of oxygen. So I'm, I'm creating a, a few layers, if you see, like this. You can do it as a teepee, or you can do it as like a log cabin sort of style fire, like, like Jenga, really. So I'm letting the oxygen go through the middle. I can still cover that middle bit. I don't want to smother it. I'm just going to let it burn a bit a minute. See, I, I, you know that log cabin fire lay I did? Yeah. I prefer doing that when the fire's already down to embers and you need to get it up again. When I first light fires, I've always preferred just doing this. What, pyramid? Yeah, I just, it's something pim primitive about it. Why would they have done it hundreds of years ago like that? It just draw, it sucks Pulls the heat. Pulls the heat up, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. It's away now. I can all smell that fish and chips already. It might be a while before we get to there. Yeah. That, I don't even need to blow that now. I'm that's just going to let that get established. And actually, yeah, that's, that's just going to go itself. There's no need to, I can add oxygen and it'll burn quicker. But because that flame's already pretty well established, I got, rather than burn through it fast by blowing oxygen, I can now use the time to go and collect a bit more firewood. So you're going to crack on with your jobs? Yeah. And you I'll... Uh, you get the fish right, you're I'm, on cooking duties I'm today. on cooking duties today, and then a couple of things I want to show the guys anyway. So yeah. that's well away. That's away. So now you've seen on TA Fishing, how TA Outdoors like their files Fires. <laughs> Files. <laughs> That's because I do Is that how much we hate to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> so now you've seen a fire lit by TA Outdoors on TA Fishing. You might want to have a go to yourself, guys. Bit of fun. And a bit of heat. Slight problem, guys. My fault the last time we were up here at base camp here, outside the old Viking house here on the back. <laughs> I left the bench out so the seat's wet. So I'm trying to dry it out quickly before he discovers it.
you can actually see the steam coming off it but it's going light so it is actually uh, drying it out oh lovely better than the hot water bottle Well, I can't do much, guys, while that, uh, till that actually burns off, because Mike always used to make a big mistake and burn on the flame, but you've got to get a big fire up and let it go down and cook on the coals, otherwise you just get smoked, everything. A um, couple of things to just talk about while I'm waiting for this fire to go down. Let's put my ear flaps down, it's getting cold now. That's better. Having to clear out my offices, and I came across some of these things. We were throwing them all out. Well, he says, nobody has DVDs, CDs, and all that business anymore. They don't store so much nowadays. So I said, but that's nearly new. And I looked at it and thought, is this not absolutely fisherman ideal with all those pockets for putting traces in? So I'm gonna keep these, and I like the idea this one's you know, bright yellow there. Um, I can keep this on the beach because for everlasting putting things down on the beach and losing it, right? So you can just tuck your traces in there. You could even be in a boat, mackerel traces, something like that. Just keeps them separated. And it looks like they've got sort of little air vents or some little ridges in there, I don't know. But there's, oh God almighty, there's plenty in there. Must be 20 or so in there. A little expanding side pocket there as well. And do you know what I could put in there? That's right, bait thread or indeed spare hooks just in this little zip up pocket there. But I do like the idea, the idea of not losing that bait thread. So that elasticated one, put your bait threads in there, close it up, not gonna lose it on the beach. Just a tip, so if you're clearing out your old CDs and everything, by all means get rid of your CDs, hang on to the pouch, could be useful. Another thing I've got to show you. I mean, I love my hat here. Especially in the winter, which we're in at the moment. I think they call them beanies. Do they call them beanies? That's fine. This is bank robbers mode. This is safe from COVID mode. And this one, wait for it, has something I've never seen before. A little box there that you can put your name and address in so that when you get lost on the beach and they find you've pegged out they can they can open it up and they know who you are and where you are and what you've been doing and everything i'm joking you press a button in the middle here oh my god is that not good and it's on i guess like led you get the fingers on it two i think it's got three settings there you go So, let's check it again. We've got, easy to do it that way, Graham. Really, really, really bright. You can see, really bright. A little bit lower, and I'm guessing economy mode. And I think, when I looked at it, it charges up on a computer cable to your computer. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? This will get used. In fact, let's go and take it and see if I can get any film on here inside the Saxon house, because it doesn't look it on this camera, but it's about to get dark. I think we're all right with the fire. Come and have a look. I love gadgets like this. Well, once we, they, they're good anyway. So, here we are. We're inside. Now look at the low light. <laughs> this is nearly totally, totally black in here. Here's Mike's bed. Well, obviously not tonight, but one of the last films. If you check his last film up, he did one here. Did a sleepover, an overnighter. You get a fire on the inside there. Now let me just click this on. Oh, look. That is... I can light the whole place up with that. Look, guys, I can film with it. That's really going to be handy. Look, there's all the thatch. Well, I'm pretty impressed with this light. That is going to be so handy. Look, you can see there, even on the low mode, I could still be tackling up at night. So I don't know where Mike got these from dark there and there 
a beanie hat keeps me warm, constantly on my head. I'm not losing, oh my God, where have I put my head torch? And more so for beach fishing, but I guess maybe even carp guys, you know, if you're doing winter carp fishing, you might want a bulb like this on your head. And of course, if you're baiting up, you can, you can put it really down low and see what you want. And wherever you turn your head, the light goes with you. I think that's a good little toy to play with and practical as well. Right, I've got to change over guys because it is cold. Billy Bean is going until it gets dark. Along comes Mr. Mongoose Skin or whatever it is. Uh, another thing might got me. One of these little boxes like this that pop open. And in there, I'll show you, it's got lots of different goodies you can play with. You've got in there, you can use these for tipping baits, look. Plastic, they're all plastic. Plastic, very squidgy, squidgy soft sweet corn. Actually feels like sweet corn. What's in this one? Lots of little swivels, hooks. Obviously I can adapt it to put what I want to put in there. Links, carpy type links. That means Graham doesn't know what to do with them. These are all, I think, carp hooks. There's a very good chance some of these are going to go sea fishing. That looks like, I'm going to pull this one out to show you this one. Don't drop those, they're valuable. That one there smacks of a very very strong wire hook it's four carp but I'm going to try that sea fishing guys that will get used in this one you've got the breakaway stops that pull apart for carp fishing it's obviously four carp fishing different coloured ones there good little boxes aren't they look all bits and bobs that go over the leads I know they go over the swivel these things go over the swivel eyes look, look some I recognise some I don't Rig tubing, do we call that? More rig tubing, different colour, and in here, beads. Oh yeah, these get used, the old boily stops. So, look, neat little box. I thought it was a neat little box, like a little box. I might change that stuff in there. I don't do a huge amount of carp fishing, obviously, but that's pocket size, absolutely pocket size. So, yet another pretty good, useful idea. No, as you know, we're not selling them. So now, I came across something when I was, again, sorting out how come I got those DVDs. And in my, I call it my silver box, which is when I go on the boat, I always take one of these, a spare, I've got GPS, I sort of know where I'm going, but just in case. And this one is a little, I call it a little bearing compass. So it's made with, you know, orienteering, that's the word I'm looking for. I can't spell it, but that's the word I'm looking for. And anybody who's looking for taking bearings like this, you look through the eyepiece there, but you would, you would hold this if you were looking at somewhere and want to know how many degrees it was. I can look at that there and that would be let's say i'm waiting for the compass just to settle you you bring this back and it'll give you a line there so 210 220 230 that's 230 degrees in that direction let's say there's a cliff a tree a mountain top some specific place that i wanted to get to so a neat little thing plastic right little plastic thing little lanyard clips take it if you're in the woods, if you're at sea, wherever. But then I looked and I've got an antique one. Now how crazy is this? It is got to be military grade. Anybody out there, ex-forces, ex-services, recognise that? I don't know whether it's First World War or Second World War, but it's really, really old. And do you know what? Some things never change, do they? Watch. Up it comes there. This piece that's folded there goes around on top, oh, and hey-ho, 
the same principle you can look through there until you see the line you want to go and what this one has here is I'm going to put it across there right obviously I think they float somebody tell me if it's well I expect the alcoholics will tell me they float in alcohol <laughs> people out there go really that's interesting I must buy some more compasses but this one has right that's it it can move like that but it has a little button on the top you push it and it, and it just locks oh there it goes I'll let you oh, you can see me do it ready I'm gonna lock it there bang you see it twitch that's locked because you don't want to damage it that's why I think it's a military one you're running you're crashing you're fighting the enemy it's banging and crashing everywhere but the same principle look at that you could you look through it like this I'm looking at the camera and the camera is well, somewhere between northwest and west I thought that was interesting just to show you the two different types there you can see them so they might be 50 or 100 years apart and they're the same thing aren't they so I, I kind of find that a little strange that some of the most basic instruments in the world can be used old time or new you've got to say the old school one is the better made isn't it I wouldn't like to think what they would cost to buy now let us know military guys I'm believing that I'm saying that's military purely because it, it will lock there so it must be in for some violent action and I guess that is it's got to be maybe even First World War. Let us know, guys. I need to. Looks like you've been, you've been doing a bit of cocaine on the right down there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's got a rather suspicious looking line down there to that board. <laughs> so much there. Not a bit too much of this left over, right? <laughs> bit of a New Year's party. <laughs> <laughs> Man, do I love this bushcraft. <laughs> Mama. <laughs> Bit of fun, isn't it? Guys, this is uh, skate and chips, a traditional English fish. With some mulled wine. With mulled wine, which is way over there. 
Let's try the chips first. Yeah, they smell good. Yeah. Nice. Okay. My skate, it just absolutely comes straight off the wing there. Is there, a lot of, is there no bone in this? There's no it's bone. Cartilage, isn't it's all cartilage, you just put it all straight off. Wow, it's fluffy meat, look at that. First time I've ever had this. That's amazing. Mm. That's really nice. Oh, it helps if it goes on my mouth, but... Mm. And this skate was courtesy of Tomo, yep. who has a charter boat, the Lorna Dune, down out of Watchit Marina. Anybody who likes to go a bit of skate and ray and stuff like that, cod, conger, bass, it's all down there, isn't it? We've mm. had some really good fishing with him. Yeah, really good mixed fishing. We did a half day that time. Mm. We must have had 30, 40 fish between both yeah, of us, in just four us hours. two. The reason we put the flour on, Wifey told me it stops it sticking to the pan. So when it looks burnt... Yeah, it's not it's, a batter. It's no, different to a batter, isn't it? It's not it, a yeah? batter, and it uh, it looks burnt, but it's only the flour that's burnt. You can still eat it, it's crunchy. Crunchy on top, it's well, only actually, flour. it gives it a bit of a crispy texture Crispy, anyway. crispy texture, yeah. It's I can see we're going to have to go fishing with Tomo again. I've got a pine needle. <laughs> well, there yeah. you go. This is bushcraft. This is bushcraft <laughs> for you, serious outdoorsman. Yeah, funny year. And mold wine's why I think I've been making the mold wine too hot, guys. Mike said, "Don't make it too hot." It totally changes the flavour if you boil it too. If you, mm. it's not meant to boil. Well, thanks for watching this episode of TA Fishing, which is a strange one. It's got a bit of fishing, a bit of bushcraft, a bit of outdoors, and some skate and chips. Don't forget to go over to Mike's one, TA Outdoors, and see what he's up to. He's always doing some sleep overnight out <laughs> everywhere. He's just living the life of Riley, doing his <laughs> overnight as in the freezing cold. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. This is the season of the witch. Ah, my beauties. Put my magic potion on there. But there you go, people. I really enjoyed being out with my son doing that cook up. He's just not it's been out doing stuff, building stuff, whatever. You know, it's uh, it's what it's all about, family at the end of the day, isn't it? Anyway, thanks for watching these two. Thanks for supporting us out there, guys. By the time you watch this one, we will have passed two million subscribers between our two channels. Mike's one is the masterclass of it. He's got 1.7 and we're plodding along. I don't do all those collabs, you know, I go around begging people to collab with me. The only collab I do is with Mike. But pretty good, father and son, so we're pleased with that. Thanks to you guys for all supporting us on both channels, TA Fishing and TA Outdoors. All I can say to you is hit the subscribe button on both channels and cheers to Alfie's Revenge. We'll see you guys next time. Hmm. Or maybe you won't. <laughs>